So, hello everyone. Um, the topic of this last lecture is going to be one of my favorite uh, theorems in mathematics, both for the statement and for the proof, um, I think. And I'm not going to go into full details on the proof, but I do want to say enough to give you an idea of what all the ingredients are and why the various, there are some various funny things that arise and I want to make them kind of make sense at the very least. Um, so, but first let me just uh, tie up some loose ends from last time. So, so we had uh, D was a fundamental discriminant negative. And we had that the set of strict equivalence classes of uh, positive definite binary quadratic forms of discriminant D, we found a different interpretation of this in terms of uh, quadratic, the quadratic field uh, F, which is um, Q adjoined square root of D. Um, we saw that this was in by, this set was naturally in bijection with the set of uh, ideal classes. So um, uh, non-zero ideals um, in the ring of integers of F um, up to uh, I equivalent to J, if and only if there exists some non-zero scalar alpha in F cross such that uh, alpha I is equal to J. Thank That's you, man. J there. And this is so-called the uh, ideal class for OF or of OF. Um, and um, well, actually, yeah. Um, but we actually, actually, we got a little better than this. We got a statement without just passing to the equivalence relation. We actually described all strict equivalences between binary quadratic forms in these terms. And in particular, that, also, that gives you a statement on automorphism. So um, uh, we also got that the, um, you know, the special orthogonal group of any such binary quadratic form will be isomorphic to the, um, well, OK module isom uh, isomorphisms from the corresponding ideal to itself. And then you can see, you can show that this is the same as the OK module isomorphisms from OK to itself. And this is the units in OK. And um, I don't want to go into all the derivations of this, but this is also just the same thing as a group called, oh, K, oh, the F became K. Well, you know what? That could happen more than once. So let me say that F equals K equals Q adjoined square root of D. So the only field we're going to be talking about is is this one, so I hope it won't cause any confusion. Um, right, so it's the a group of roots of unity uh, in K. Um, and um, independently of the ideal, or in other, in other words, independently of the quadratic form you talk about. Um, and uh, this is actually a, a very small group, so it's plus or minus one if uh, D is different from minus three and minus four. Uh, it's, um, you know, mu three, so that, I mean, mu six, the group of six roots of unity, if D is minus three, and it's mu four, the group of fourth roots of unity, if D is minus four. So it's some very explicitly understandable thing. So describing the automorphisms, but okay, this is, this is kind of a parenthetical. Let's go back to the main point here. So we have the strict isomorphism, a strict equivalence class of binary quadratic forms is the same as this thing over here, the so-called class group. And the important thing about the class group is that it's an abelian group. So the set of strict equivalence classes of positive definite binary quadratic forms of discriminant D has a natural abelian group structure. Um, just induced from on this side, the product of ideals. It's actually a little bit complicated to translate it back over into the language of binary quadratic forms, although it can be done. Um, now I wanna say that this abelian group structure um, sort of explains a lot of, or gives the answer to a lot of natural questions that arise in this theory of binary quadratic forms. So there were some questions we had earlier that we can now kind of answer in terms of the group structure. So question one, um, so given, F and G, uh, you know, binary quadratic forms, positive definite binary quadratic forms of discriminant D. When 
is F not strictly equivalent, but you know, just non-strictly equivalent. So this a priori more natural um, notion of just being isomorphic under an arbitrary linear change of or invertible linear change of variables, not uh, necessarily one lying in SL2Z. And um, the answer is um, if and only if either, uh, so, well, uh, So either they're, they, are, they are strictly equivalent, right? That's one possibility. If they're strictly equivalent, then um, they're conjugate under GL2Z. Or in other words, if their classes in this finite agreement groups are, are equal, then this happens. And the other way, the other only way it can happen is if the classes are inverses in terms of the abelian group structure. And um, I didn't put this on the problem set, but it is a very nice exercise. So if you do want to, if you're interested in this and you want to think about it, you can, you can do that. Um, so in other words, the set of, uh, so the set of um, isomorphism classes of binary quadratic forms without the strictness or without the orientation condition uh, is just a, a quotient of the ideal class group mod an equivalence relation, which identifies every element of the group with its inverse. Um, now, this is a funny equivalence relation. So it's not modding up by normal subgroups. So you don't get a group structure anymore um, once you do this. And so if you were to not do SL2Z equivalence, but GL2Z equivalence, then you'd lose this really awesome thing, this abelian group structure. So, you, um, so this gives one justification for why the, you want to look at strict equivalence and not usual isomorphism, because this fundamental structure just is kind of not visible if you impose too many, um, if you identify too many objects. Um, okay. And the other question, uh, so given FG, again, positive definite binary quadratic forms of discriminant D, when are F and G in the same genus. So that, uh, that means that uh, they're isomorphic over the p-adic integers for all primes p. So we're kind of asking about the, yeah. Um, so being in the same genus, but not being isomorphic is kind of like giving a counterexample to the um, uh, integral form of the Hasse Minkowski theorem. So it's a very natural question about this. And this is also going to be answered very nicely in terms of the group structure. So if and only if. Um, so uh, if you take f, uh, that f is equal to g times uh, some x squared for some uh, x in the class group of OF. So if and only if f and g differ by a square. Um, so actually, so um, so that means that sort of the the genus class group is just equal to the class group of OK modulo of squares. So that is a finite abelian group. So classifying according to genus, um, strict equivalence according to genus is kind of a, a nice and reasonable thing to do. And this is again that I want to emphasize the the thing. This kind of classification is the the one that generalizes better to quadratic forms of higher um, higher number of variables. So this uh, this was just to give. I don't want to explain why either of these is true. This one's actually quite difficult. So I don't don't take this as an exercise unless you're Gauss. I don't know. Um, but uh, um, yeah, um, I just wanted to say that this this uh, yeah yeah this group structure gives a lot of information. Um, but now let's uh, move to the actual topic of the lecture, which is Dirichlet's class number formula, um, which gives another, the, the proof of which also goes through this correspondence, but doesn't quite make use of the group structure per se, but makes use of the interpreta uh, alternative interpretation in terms of ideals. Um, so Dirichlet's class number formulas. So from now on, there exists uh, a version of it for arbitrary D, but I'm just going to take the simplest special case. So for now on, take uh, P a prime congruent to three mod four 
and we'll let uh, d be minus p. Um, so, so we're taking the case when d is one mod four and it's square free and the simplest kind of square free number is a, well, the simplest kind of square free negative number is just minus a prime. So that's, that's what we're looking at here. Um, uh, then the theorem is as follows. It gives a closed formula for uh, H minus P. So recall, this is the number of elements in the ideal class group of, uh, you know. um, so this is, that's, that's by definition. So this number is equal to, and it gives a closed form expression for it, which I think is uh, very remarkable. So, um, ah, I'm sorry. It gives a closed form expression. Um, yeah, so that, let me, okay. Let me write um, uh, mu minus p for the number of roots of, of unity uh, in uh, q would go in square root of minus p, which is just equal to uh, two if p is different from three and six if p is equal to three. Um, so, but just to, have a uniform treatment. So then the correct thing you want to find a formula for is not H minus P in isolation, but H minus P divided by mu minus P. And I'll make a comment about why that's the natural thing in just a second. But the formula for this, Dirichlet's formula for this says that it's equal to uh, minus one over two P times the sum from K equals one to P minus one of the Legendre symbol K on P times K. So this is just something you can just, you know, bang out by hand, right? I mean, given your prime number P, you just calculate all the Legendre symbols, multiply them by, weight them by the integer, the least positive residue, and then divide that yeah, minus one over two P times that. It's, it's a priori an integer, right? It's not obvious that it's greater than or equal to zero. I mean, greater than or equal to one, actually, that it's positive. Um, and I am not aware of any proof, any sort of independent proof that this quantity is positive, other than showing that it equals, uh, oh no, not an integer, a rational number, of course. I mean, up to the, well, yeah. When, I mean, when you cancel the mu p, so what should I say? Uh, um, yeah. Um, so it's a very, very strange, um, very strange kind of expression. And um, so I wanna make a remark about why the right thing to have, the right, the thing that should have a formula is the thing on the left-hand side. So just a small remark. Um, so H minus P over mu minus P is what's called the groupoid cardinality of the ideal class groupoid. So you don't just have an ideal class group. You have, uh, you know, that's where you take ideals up to this equivalence relation. But you actually have a groupoid where you have an object. The objects of your groupoid are ideals, and the morphisms are these um, equivalences given by multiplication by alpha, alpha and f cross. Um, and for a general groupoid, the groupoid cardinality is so. For a general groupoid uh, C, uh, the groupoid cardinality, a finite groupoid. Um, is the sum overall, so x uh, in C representing isomorphism classes. So you take a sum over a set of representatives for the isomorphism classes, um, and then you weight by the automorphism group of that representative. And it's this number that sort of um, uh, behaves well, like has good, good general properties in the world of finite groupoids. Um, so I don't want to explain too much about why that's the case, but this is kind of just some general theory tells you that this is the correct thing to be looking at. And in the special case of the ideal class group, all of the automorphism groups have the same cardinality, <coughs> um, namely this mu minus p. And so this just reduces to the count of the number of isomorphism classes divided by that common cardinality of the automorphism group. But again, when you move to higher numbers of variables, um, 
you're not going to have a group structure anymore, but you still do have a, a groupoid of binary quadratic forms up to strict equivalences in the same genus. And the thing you have a formula for is exactly this groupoid cardinality, and that's called the Siegel mass formula. So, um, yeah. So this is kind of the, the correct general perspective here. But that, that's just a remark. We're not really going to do anything with that. Um, right. So now, um, uh, where does this formula come from? It comes from combining three separate ingredients um, based on the following analytic definitions. So, so the first definition is of the Dedekind zeta function. So um, zeta function uh, f of s, um, it's the function of a real level. Let's say a, a function of a real variable s um, defined by an infinite sum. So you take the sum over all non-zero ideals um, in the ring of integers and one divided by the norm of the ideal uh, to the s. And you should compare with the uh, Riemann zeta function, uh, which is the sum over all natural numbers greater than or equal to one of one over n to the s. Um, Uh, which you could write, I guess, as a zeta q of s. So if you take the analogous definition for replacing f by the rational numbers, you'll just get this here. Um, and the other definition, the other analytic function that's going to be important for us is the uh, so-called Dirichlet L series with respect to the quadratic character chi. So this will be the, um, the Legendre symbol. Um, so chi is a the Legendre symbol viewed as a function from Z mod PZ cross to plus or minus one. Um, and you extend by zero uh, to a function uh, from Z mod PZ to uh, minus one, minus one comma one comma zero. So you define it to be zero on the, the missing residue class here, namely zero. So you say, declare that it goes from, uh, that it sends zero to zero. Um, then the definition of the Dirichlet L series, it's, it's like a twisted form of the Riemann zeta function. So it's the sum over all n greater than or equal to one of chi of n over n to the s. And all of these uh, converge absolutely, or both of these, I should say, converge absolutely uh, for uh, s bigger than one. Okay, now Dirichlet's theorem is a consequence of three separate ingredients which relate to these um, analytic uh, functions here. So, um, so um, ingredient one is that the zeta function of f, oops, uh, zeta function of f is the product of the Riemann zeta function with this uh, quadratic uh, L series. Ingredient two is that, well, you may know if you've studied the Riemann zeta function that it has a, um, simple pole at s equals, so it converges for s greater than one, a real part of s greater than one if you want to use complex variables, and it has a simple pole at s equals one with residue equal to one. So let me rewrite this kind of in real variable language. So the limit as s tends to one of s minus one times the Riemann zeta function is equal to one. And now let me write down the analogous expression for uh, the this quadratic field f. So. This is, so let me just recall F is Q adjoined square root of uh, minus P. Um, so this is equal to two pi divided by the square root of P um, uh, times exactly this quantity class number divided by mu minus P. Um, so this is kind of really where this, uh, yeah, where, where this expression uh, appears in the whole story. Um, 
And then the ingredient three is that um, if you take the limit as S goes to one plus um, of just the Dirichlet L series, LS chi, you get an expression that is, um, oh, now I have to look at my notes to make sure I get it right. Um, yes, minus pi divided by uh, P to the three halves, <laughs> sum from K equals one uh, to P minus one, chi of K times K. Okay. Um, now this ingredient three, uh, this is uh, your problem set. Today. So I split this, this is a big long calculation, which I split into five pieces and put those as the five problems on the problem set. Um, yes, Eleutherios. Uh, in the ingredient three, where does S go in the limit? Uh, one, one, always S goes to one. One plus, right, from the plus, rest. Okay. Yeah, one from above, because it's only defined when S is bigger than one. Yeah, yeah I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, the, the series defining, I mean, the series is actually convergent at S equals one. So I could write this as L of, I mean, this is actually equal to L of one chi. But you always have to be aware that it's only only conditionally convergent, not absolutely convergent. So you have to be kind of careful with this. <coughs> careful with this notion here. And just for uniformity, I'm choosing to write it as the limit of the values at which it's absolutely convergent. Um, okay. So why do these three ingredients imply? Uh, Dirichlet's formula? Well, also, um, uh, so, uh, the ingredient one, the, uh, one is for uh, what values of s? Is it for uh, s such that real uh, real part of s is greater than one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For s greater than one. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a quality of like series, a formal series, really, and then it's valid wherever they wherever everything converges. Um, yeah. So, well, it's because, so we know this, uh, the, the this limit here is equal to this number here, but given this expression here, we can calculate that limit in a different way. It's the same as the limit as S goes to one of S minus one times zeta S times L of S chi. And then that limit will be one times this value. So you learn that this has to be equal to this. And then you cancel the pi's, magically the pi's cancel. The square root of P knocks this down to just a P. Um, and um, you get the, um, and the two goes in the bottom, right? When you solve for this and you get exactly the Dirichlet class number formula. Okay. So as I've kicked ingredient three to you guys, so I'll just talk about ingredients um, one and two. Um, So for ingredient one, well, we defined it as this sum over non-zero ideals of the norm of the ideal to the minus s. Um, but there, well, let me remind you actually of something about the Riemann zeta function first. So this is the sum of n greater than or equal to one of n to the minus s, but there's this famous Euler product so you can rewrite it as a product over all primes of one over one minus P to the, uh, and now I should make sure I don't get it wrong. Yeah, minus S. Um, so this is a famous identity uh, in, for the Riemann zeta function. And it follows if you expand this out as a geometric series. So this is one plus P to the minus S plus P to the minus two S plus dot, dot, dot. And then imagine just in your head, uh, you know, expanding this infinite product out. And what you'll find is that as a consequence of unique prime factorization, you'll be getting precisely these terms here by just applying the, the distributive rule uh, or, or FOIL or whatever people call it. Yeah, for multiplying sums together. 
you have to match each, you know, match all possible terms with each other, and you're exactly building a prime factorization of some number, uh, and then raised to the minus s power. Like this will be p to the minus two to the s, and so on and so forth. So that's the Euler product factorization for the Riemann zeta function. And the reason the Dedekind zeta function is defined as it is, is so that you have an analogous Euler product factorization. Because we know that every non-zero ideal is uniquely a product of prime ideals, or maximal ideals, I should say, non-zero prime ideals. Um, so you get the analogous um, Euler prime factorization over all maximal ideals uh, of the ring of integers. Um, and then also you use that the norm is multiplicative. But, um, so we're trying to prove a product formula. I mean, a, a product formula for zeta fs as a product of two things. So it's good that we now have zeta fs itself written as a product. Um, so now uh, we group uh, maximal ideals. P according to to which uh, prime P they contain. Um, so each maximal ideal, this was more or less on your problem set from last time, each maximal ideal contains a unique prime P. Um, and so it, there was, yes, and there was this, um, um, yeah, so, and if uh, P splits, then there are two primes, uh, P1, P2, as we say, lying above P, uh, which means that uh, the ideal P generated by P is P1 times P2. Um, and uh, if P is inert, uh, then uh, P itself is a prime ideal. So P is its own prime ideal factorization, even in this larger ring, and P ramifies. Uh, then P is equal to the square, uh, sorry, then the ideal generated by P is equal to the square of some uh, ideal there. Um, and now let's look at what contributions to this infinite product you get from each of these three cases. So, um, from when P splits, uh, so then the, if P splits, then the norm of P1 uh, and P2 uh, are both equal to P because the norm of their product is the norm of P, which is P squared. Um, so, uh, so we get the Euler factors. So one over one minus norm of P1 to the minus S times one over one minus norm of P2 to the minus s. Uh, this just becomes um, you get the Euler factor for the Riemann zeta function and then itself again. Um, and if p is inert, then uh, well, it's, it's p is a prime ideal and it has norm uh, p squared. So we get uh, one over one minus the norm of p to the minus s, which is one over one minus p to the minus two s, which is one over one minus p to the minus s times ah, one over one plus p to the minus s. Okay, sorry for making that a little. So then here again, we find we recognize the Euler factor for the Riemann zeta function, and then this x multiplied by some extra term. Um, and if p ramifies. Then there's only one prime in consideration, but it has has to have norm equal to p by the same reasoning, and so we actually get uh, just one over one minus uh, p to the minus s, which I'll write as one over one minus p to the minus s times one. So here again, we recognize the Euler factor for the Riemann zeta function, and then this term here. But you also saw in your problem set that. The question of whether P splits is inert or ramified is detected by um, a character mod D. And in the case where D is minus P, this character is exactly the, uh, the Legendre character mod P. So P splits if and only if um, uh, 
uh, the value of the Legendre character. Oh no, I shouldn't have been using P. Oh no. Sorry. P was supposed to be our fixed prime at the beginning and now I'm using it for a variable prime. Um, well, sorry guys. So yeah. the, the, the character of P, um, if and only if the character of P is equal to minus one, um, oh, sorry, the character of P is equal to one. Um, P is inert if and only if the character of P is equal to minus one and P ramifies if and only if the character of P is equal to zero. And when you, when you plunk all this together, you get that um, the zeta function of S is equal to the Riemann zeta function times the product over all primes P of one over one minus chi of P times P to the minus S. So it just matches up. Um, and this by the exact same uh, unique prime factorization argument and the multiplicativity of this character chi, um, this is just the L series. So there's also an Euler factorization for the L series. And that is the explanation for um, ingredient one. It's kind of just a repackaging of this study of um, study of how primes split uh, in this quadratic extension. Um, right. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so now let's move on to the second ingredient. So ingredient two, this is kind of the, I guess maybe this is the, I don't know, they're all the main point in some sense, but this is the one where this expression H minus P over mu minus P actually appears. So we want to know that the limit, oops, uh, limit as S goes to one plus of S minus one times zeta F of S is equal to two pi over square root of P. Uh, times h minus p over mu p mu minus p and i'm not going to give again full details in this analytic um, evaluation but i want at least to make clear where all of these factors come from um so so whereas the product formula the first ingredient was proved by making a multiplicative analysis of the zeta function based on the euler product um this will be based on an additive kind of analysis of the zeta function. So we'll actually just directly use the definition. So zeta f s is the sum over all non-zero ideals of one over norm of the ideal to the s. And now naturally enough, we're gonna partition the ideals into their various ideal classes. So we'll let, we'll let i1 up to i h minus p be representatives for the ideal class group. So that every ideal is equivalent to uh, a unique one of these i sub k's. Um, so then this is equal to the sum over uh, sum from i equals little i equals one to h minus p of the sum over all uh, non-zero ideals uh, in the same class as i sub little i. Um, of one over norm of that ideal to the S. Okay. So it will suffice to show that, uh, you know, if you multiply this by S, so the limit of limit as S goes to one plus of each of these terms of S minus one times this, uh, Uh, is equal to the same thing without the h minus p term, right? So two pi over square root of p times mu minus p. Because if each of these things has that same behavior on the limit as s goes to one plus, if each of these has the same residue, you know, then when you sum them up, it'll just multiply that number by h minus p. And that will be where this h minus p factor comes from. Okay. Um, now I'm going to make a make my life a little bit easier and only take uh, only explain what's going on in the for the principal ideal class. 
it's not substantially different for a non-principal ideal class, but it's just a little more technical to explain. So I want to I want to cut to the chase. So I'll just analyze the principal ideal class. So we'll see that uh, yeah, limit as s goes to one plus of s minus one times uh, the sum over all non-zero principal ideals. Uh, one over norm of i to the s uh, is equal to two pi over a square root of p times mu minus p. Okay. Um, okay, now we're going to make this factor go away. Because look, what is the condition here? We're in the principal ideal class. That means we're generated by some element alpha. But alpha is not uniquely determined. A generator of an ideal is not uniquely determined. It's only determined up to multiplication by units. Um, so let's just note then that if, what, what if we removed that, right? So what if we just summed over all alpha in OK minus 0 of 1 over norm of alpha uh, to the s? Well, then we'd be counting each principal ideal. I mean, this is the norm of, same as the norm of the principal ideal generated by alpha. But we're now counting each principal ideal more than once. Namely, we're counting it by weighting it by the number of generators for that principal ideal, which is the exact same thing as the number of roots of unity. So this would be equal to mu minus p times the guy we're interested in. So some i naught equal to 0, i is equal to principal ideal generated by alpha for some alpha. 1 over norm of the ideal to the s. Um, so actually, it suffices to see that sum of all alpha and OK minus 0, 1 over norm of alpha to the s. Uh, and then I have to multiply by s minus 1 and take the limit as s goes to 1, uh, that this is just equal to 2 pi over square root of p. OK. Right. And now I want to say um, it's going to pay to abstract just slightly. It's not going to be important anymore that this OK is the ring of integers in a imaginary quadratic field. That's not going to be relevant at all. The only thing that's going to be relevant is that it's a lattice inside the complex numbers. So, so let's make a more abstract claim. For any uh, full lattice, uh, lambda inside the complex numbers, i.e., L is uh, some z uh, omega 1 plus z omega 2, where omega 1 and omega 2 are r linearly independent. So it's just, I mean, you have some picture like this, right? I mean, it's just just a lattice as you would imagine it in the complex numbers. Um, so it could be a square lattice or not, but, um, and in our case, it will be the ring of integers of our imaginary quadratic field. Um, then if you take the limit as S goes to one plus of S minus one times um, the sum over all non-zero elements in the lattice, of one over, I mean, I can still write the norm of that element, right? Again, norm just means, uh, norm of alpha just means alpha times alpha bar or absolute value of alpha squared, right? So it makes makes perfect sense for an arbitrary complex number as well. Um, uh, then what's this gonna be? It's gonna be two pi divided by um, the area of the fundamental parallelogram. So um, so if you take a fundamental domain for action by translation by elements in the lattice, um, then you get some rectangle like this, and you calculate its area, and you take 2 pi divided by that. Um, so, so why does this abstract claim imply the theorem? 
objects. Um, so to see this, this finishes the job, we need to know that area of the fundamental parallelogram uh, is equal to square root of pi uh, for lattice being O, a uh, uh, square root of P, sorry, O being a uh, Q adjoined square root of minus P. But in general, there's a formula for this area. You can calculate such an area as a determinant. Um, so if you imagine, so there's this first basis vector, which I guess was omega one and the second basis vector called omega two, um, then this is also, I mean, then you get this fundamental parallelogram by applying to the standard uh, you know, unit square, the linear map, which is omega one in the first column and omega two in the second column. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so this is also just the determinant of, um, if you take yeah, omega one, omega two. And we have an explicit basis for our ring of integers, right? So we can just calculate the determinant. And it's just a small calculation that I'll um, avoid doing. But that's how you can check that it, you get, do indeed get square root of p. Um, <clears throat> in general, you get, for, for d, you get square root of, I mean, like minus d, I guess, square root of absolute value of d. Um, OK. So now we're, we're down to something kind of it doesn't look as scary, I suppose. So this uh, this uh, abstract claim, um, and in fact, <clears throat> this abstract claim can be proved very similarly to how you show uh, that the limit is s goes to one plus s minus one times the Riemann zeta function of s is equal to one. So. So the idea is, um, well, so the, the, the key claim is that you can approximate the sum by an integral. So, um, right, so more specific, I wanna, I mean, I don't wanna get into too many details here again, but, um, the claim is that if you do this here, this is close enough to, <laughs> um, or actually if you do this and then multiply by this area of the fundamental parallelogram, that's close enough to the integral, um, sort of a, a, a plane integral over all alpha of um, one over norm of alpha to the minus s and then kind of, I guess, dx dy. Um, Um, so now this is an integral over all of the, the complex plane. Um, and the reason this should be believable is you can imagine, you can sort of approximate this, this function on all, on all of the complex numbers. I mean, maybe minus the origin, but the, I mean, the integral will be, it's an improper integral, but it will converge. As I said, there are some analytic details that you know, need to be looked at here, but you can, you can approximate this function, one over norm of alpha to the minus s, defined on the entire complex plane minus the origin by kind of a step function, which just says, okay, if you're in this, fun, if you're in this parallelogram, then just be constant on value given by the value of your function at this lattice point. And if you're in this parallelogram, so you always select the lower left, um, always make a constant function with value of the lower left <coughs> um, integer um, lattice point. Um, and then, um, so you make some kind of two-dimensional step function, and on the one that will be very that will be fairly close to this. But on the one hand, when you take the integral of that step function, um, you're exactly going to pick up a factor of the area of the parallelogram times the the sum over uh, the values on those lattice points. Okay. Um, and then you can actually calculate. That the limit. Uh, well, you can actually calculate this thing. I mean, um, oh, did, oh, shoot! I did. I put a, a minus. I did a did the mistake that people always make that they do. You know, there's always this choice where they write one over n to the s, or you write n to the minus s. 
And I, I swear I've seen like a million people out, right, one over n to the minus s, just kind of <laughs> their hand makes a mistake. And I've done that too. Um, right. Uh, yeah. So you can actually calculate this um, by, uh, yeah. Well, let me just explain the technique. So, so you integrate over circles. So you're doing a two dimensional integral over a plane. Uh, by, but you do it instead by integrating over the circles, and on the circles, the, the value of the norm of fu the function is constant. And then you'll pick up a pi factor from the fact that these are circles, and then it'll actually reduce to the exact same calculation you have for the Riemann zeta function, um, sort of when you then integrate over the remaining variable, which is the, 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 radi you know, the radius of the circle. So you'll have, some, you'll have like one over r to the s, and then you're going to be picking up some pi factor from integrating along the circle. And then you'll essentially just reduce to the <coughs> reduce to the claim for um, the Riemann zeta function. Yes, yeah, so Theros. A bit of a maybe a very simple uh, question, but when you say we integrate, you integrate in circles. You mean that we just do that integral in like polar coordinates, right? Yes, That's exactly. Double integral. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. Yeah. So what? Yeah, I should just say. I mean. I don't know why I didn't say that. I mean, that's something that people study in, in calculus, right? So you, you change coordinates and they're great using polar coordinates. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, and then you'll pick up a pi factor and then you'll get the same calculation as you had for the Riemann zeta function, which again is just, you can evaluate the integral and see that the, the claim holds. Um, so this was only for the principal ideal class, but in fact, the non the kid the non principal ideal class is also reduced to the very same abstract claim. Uh, so it's just for a slightly different lattice. Um, so if, if, yeah, um, the lattice is given by the inverse fractional ideal of the ideal of representing your ideal class. Um, but it's still just a lattice, and you can again understand what the volume of the parallelogram is, and um, everything works out. So. My special gift to you on the last day is that we're, um, we're ending early. <laughs> so I wanna say also thanks to all of you. This was an, a really great experience for me having such, um, you know, such attentive and sharp students um, and um, contributing to, uh, contributing to the, the environment and making my lectures so much better. So I, um, I really do appreciate you guys. Um, and um, yeah, I'd like to say thanks. But also to the people who haven't said anything. Thank you also for paying attention or not paying attention, showing up. I mean, you know, um, I do, I appreciate everybody. Uh, yes, Elferos. Uh, I mean, I guess we should clap. Yeah, there's a. I, I saw you guys clapping. It's okay. You don't have to unmute and clap. <laughs> let's let's have questions instead. <laughs> no, don't mean to interrupt that, but I uh, I do have one tiny question. Uh, yeah. So we have this uh, formula, right? This uh, I think it's a, it's called the Dirichlet formula for the involving the the class number in terms of this, well, this M minus B, that's something that we've studied in the tutorial sheets. And I'm just wondering how, like, how do we use this formula, right? Do you have any, like, are there any applications of that to compute stuff? Like, how can I use this to, do we use this to compute a class number or? It's a good, yeah, you, you could. I mean, it's a, here, you did it by hand, right? For the first few fundamental discriminants. Yeah. Compute class numbers. So I wonder which one's faster. You could also use this formula to compute by hand. Um, I mean, the nice thing with a by hand computation using the tools from lecture 12 that, that you gave to us is that I can, we can also have explicit reduced forms. So yes. I don't just get a class number, but I also get some reduced forms. Then we have that theorem about which yeah. primes are represented. So I get this extra nice stuff. Yeah, you get more from that version. Yeah. But I think that probably this one is just faster. I mean, if you just yeah, want to know the class number, but it's yeah. true that you get more from the other approach. Um, I don't know. I'm not an, first of all, I'm not an expert in this. Like, um, so I'm, 
I'm kind of, it's a little embarrassing that I've chose to lecture on, on this topic because it's more just a, a love I had as an undergraduate. And I thought I would give it onward to you guys, undergraduates. I mean, it was one of my favorite things as an undergrad. So I thought it makes sense, but I'm not an expert on it. So I don't, I mean, I'm not good at giving answers to questions like this. What is this used for? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, no, that's, that's fine. But I do, I do know that the, yeah, I don't know anything that it's actually used for. It's just sort of a gem, mm -hmm. a little gem sitting there. Um, mm -hmm. And, but of course it also, I mean, these kinds of um, formulas like for the residue of the, you know, formulas for residues of zeta functions or L functions or special values of L functions. This is a whole huge world in arithmetic geometry. And there are some amazing, fascinating conjectures about them, which are, I mean, for the most part, completely out of reach. Um, but they're kind of a driving, like generalizing this kind of formula is a, a driving force for a lot of um, a lot of arithmetic geometry, analytic number theory. Um, it's a huge area. So I think it more stand, it's, it, it's more like a more like a finished product in a sense than a thing that you kind of um, use to do other stuff. To my understanding, it's like a wow, what a cool formula. Let's try to do that in other situations as well. Um, I see. Thank you. Yeah. But again, I'm very much not an expert, so don't don't trust my answer. That's just based on my limited understanding. Uh, so essentially, uh, uh, in the lecture, uh, we have shown uh, a closed formula for this uh, finding the class number when the discriminant is minus a prime. When yes. prime is, is equal to three naught. So. Uh, I was just wondering uh, because this uh, class number one formula, uh, class number one problem for uh, negative uh, discriminant seemed to be a difficult problem. You said this story, right? About he can find solving this. So I, I was wondering, probably there doesn't exist a trivial formula uh, or, or a simple extension of this formula for other discriminants, right? Uh, which are not. There, there does. There does. Oh, there does. Okay. okay. Yeah, there does. Um, and actually, you can see using the result from the previous problem set describing non-trivial two torsion in the class group, that if you're not minus a prime P3 mod four, then you can't have class number one. So um, in fact, uh, I mean, this formula would be all you need to know to attack that problem, but I don't know any way of using this formula to attack that problem. It's, um, yeah. Yes, Eleutherius? Um, what, could you please repeat that that last thing that you said in your in your answer about the class number one? So if if, if p is not prime, then h minus p cannot be one. Right, because where p is p's not, fundamental, if, right? If p is not minus a prime um, or or minus four, yeah, then uh, or no, it could be four, okay or minus minus four eight also has one. Yeah, or minus yeah or minus four times a prime, I should say. But you can actually rule that out. There's a way to rule that out um, as well. So, but that's not going to be obvious from what I say. But if d is not, well, okay, let me say if d if, if d is one mod four and d, and and minus d is not a prime, then it has more than one prime factor, right? And then you saw in your problem set that if you if you just take that uh, that then that prime will ramify, and if you so it's p becomes you know a, a math frac p squared. Um, and then that math frac p is going to be non-trivial in the ideal class group. So it's going to, yeah, gener generate, in fact, those, the, those prime divisors will generate uh, two torsion. And the only relation between them is that when you take the product of all of them, you get one in the ideal class group. So as long as you have more than one prime factor, you get non-trivial two torsion. I see. Thank you. Yeah, what about four times a prime? Um, no, no, wait, no, no, it was D, D square free. The, the condition was D square free. Wait, no, no, wait, I'm confused. Uh, I know, yeah, oh, right, right, right. Uh, no, D mod four square free. But then you look factor D as a product. I know, you look at the primes dividing D. Okay, so indeed, um, no, no, if you look more, no, the argument does handle everything. So I was, I was just getting confused because the argument shows that if, if D has more than one prime divisor, 
then you get non-trivial two torsion. So this only leaves minus p, p congruent to three mod four, or minus four or minus eight. So that, those are then the only possibilities. Yeah. Yes, Philip Ferris. So uh, we define this this genus class group, right? Uh, this uh, uh, class, uh, well, the the ideal class group of uh, of F modulo the squares. And I mean, if I if I recall correctly from the last lecture, we had that the the ideal class group was, well, technically, I think I should say isomorphic to the Picard group of the the ring of integers. Is there any like? Do people do that as well in when studying the Picard group? Like, is there any interest in Picard group modulo the squares? I don't think there's any interest in it above like the same interest you would have for Picard group modulo the cubes or Picard oh, group I, yeah. powers. And just on abstract grounds, one way to understand an abelian group is to understand, you know, how many twos there are in it, so to speak, or how many threes there are. In it. Um, so, uh, not that I'm aware of is the answer. Um, okay. So the, 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 I mean, this is again something very special to this binary quadratic case that the genus can be ex genus classes can be expressed in terms of. Oh, you don't have the ideal class group really for higher dimensional quadratic forms. You don't have a group. So I mean, it's, kind of, it's again some sort of special phenomenon. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think in the last problem set, we have this uh, black box that the class group modulo the class group square uh, is an abelian group of order two power r minus one where. Yeah, yeah. Um, and today you were talking about this. Uh, so basically those represent the isomorphic uh, classes of quadratic forms that are isomorphic over ZP. So how does r come up? It comes up because you can detect you can detect genus classes by means of a certain homomorphism to, well, so if you have a, a binary quadratic form of discriminant D, you can ask which residue class is mod D it hits, um, co-prime to D, let's say. And it can only hit the ones for which the value, on which the value of this um, character chi is trivial. So that's um, something we more or less saw. So, you, and then it turns out you actually do get a homomorphism from um, the ideal class group to the kernel of that homomorphism modulo the subgroup, which is the image of the principal norms, uh, the, uh, and which is the kind of the, the residue classes that are hit by the principal form of discriminant D. And so, and then you can just, you can just calculate the size of that quotient group and you find it's the same thing. It's again, this two group of size, uh, uh, num uh, you know, two to the number of prime factors of d minus one. And then you give a separate argument to say that the homomorph the, this homomorphism has kernel exactly the squares of the ideals. And then, and then that's how you kind of, so this is, this is, um, yeah. Um, so it comes up by, you, you, you figure out way, whether you're, so yeah, you figure out whether you're in the same genus or not by looking at by basically by looking not at ZP for every prime P, but just directly looking modulo D essentially. And then you can cook up some invariance there um, is more is the, the simple version of the answer. So being isomorphic over ZP for every prime P is the same as being isomorphic mod N for every N, for every natural number N. That's some kind of uh, Chinese remainder theorem compactness argument. And then it turns out the Q N to look at is just D. Um, and that's where the kind of D pops up on that side as well. I see, thank you. You're welcome.
And I think in this book, uh, Problems of the Form Expert was M. Weisberg, which I now have looked at. It gives a, <laughs> another way of understanding this genus theory um, in terms of more class field theory. So like a lot of what we said here is kind of amounts to class field theory for quadratic extensions of Q. But then you can understand this genus theory in terms of quadratic extensions of your quadratic field and applying class field theory to that. So um, yeah, so if you want a more advanced perspective on this um, kind of subject, you can look in that book, which is in the, the list of references. Cox theorem, yeah. Right, theorem for, thanks, uh, thanks, Freddy. That's that's the more lowbrow, like Gauss genus theory version. But yeah, the class field theory version, I think uh, some of us were looking at it yesterday, actually, including Ramanujan. I think that's like chapter five, if I remember correctly. Okay. Yeah. So he does, yeah, he does both the lowbrow and the highbrow versions, yeah. It's amazing that Gauss could do all this stuff kind of by hand with just binary quadratic forms. And yeah, as like a 19 year old or whatever, I don't know. It's just like, <laughs> he wrote this book when he was 21 or something. It's just because he's going with Medicaid. I don't know. Um, don't feel too bad guys. We haven't, uh, you know, reached those heights yet. <laughs> <laughs>